Uh, we're here representing the esports industry. Uh, there's two panels today specifically about esports. This is more of the business side of the industry. We've got uh, Roger, as, as we just heard to my left. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody to do some quick introductions. But we've got teams, we've got a publisher, and we've got an agency all represented here, uh, all key parts of this esports ecosystem. So, um, Roger, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Roger Canada. Um, I work for Comcast Universal NBC and oversee all the esports partnerships of the uh, Fusion and Fusion University. As um, I've been doing this for about two months. Previously, I worked in the NBA. I built out the NBA 2K League for Mark Cuban and the Dallas Mavericks. Hello, my name is Ramon. I, I'm the director of eSports at Tencent. Prior to working at Tencent, I used to be at Riot Games. And prior to Riot Games, I used to work at Blizzard Entertainment. And I've been on the publisher side close to 15 years at this point. Uh, my name is Mike. Um, previously before GTA, I uh, worked at EEG, where I led up digital. Um, part of that, I was at Live Nation's Electronic Music Festival division and led up digital for all their electronic music festivals around the, around the country and the world. Before that, I worked at OMD, uh, doing a lot of media buying and planning for Call of Duty, but now I represent some of the top Twitch streamers and pro players like Pokemon, The Sites Coast, I'm a Cutie Pie, and Apple Moon. Perfect, thanks guys. So let's just jump straight in, you know, and, and I would encourage you guys to, to answer in, in any sort of order, you know, it's going to kind of go like this in the beginning, I feel, like right to left, or left to right, but uh, feel free to just take the lead. So uh, where I want to start today, uh, the, the concept of partnerships and uh, sponsorships too as a subset of partnering uh, takes on many different forms uh, depending on the context. And so each of you have a very unique lens on how you all have commercial partners, you integrate sponsors with what you do. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about your category, uh, publisher, team, agency, uh, and how you guys develop partnerships uh, and some of the ways that you play with uh, sponsors and different brands. Um, yeah, um, so for us, when we talk to brands, it's always to make sure um, that we're putting our best support. Um, we have the saying that we only want to hit home runs. Um, Everyone knows that in the beginning of esports, it was kind of a giant rat race in terms of, you know, there's no rhyme or reason why one team or one league or one uh, streamer has a sponsorship over the other. It was just kind of a giant rat race of who was the first person to talk to the brands. So for us, we always wanted to make sure that whatever campaign that we ran uh, was authentic. Um, you probably didn't hear that word a lot, but you know, was authentic. Um, you know, was speaking to speaking the language of our of our streamers of our talent making sure that whatever campaign we did, uh, we would under-promise, over-deliver, and make sure that you know, we brought it down to a CPM level, right? Um, we always wanted to make sure that whatever campaign that we did was always just not targeting our fans and our community, but also speaking to that brand manager. Um, being able to translate our uh, reporting and our results, not just quickly within like a 40 to 72 hour turnaround, but also making sure that we can Know, back it into impression, back into uh, ECPM or cost review, or provide some sort of ROI so that we can actually start proving um, that esports is a super digitally engaged audience. So, this has been an interesting journey and experience. Looking back maybe 10, 12 years ago, inside that space, what we mostly saw were what we call endemic brands that would start entering that space. By endemic, I mean brands that would have products that would primarily focus and resonate on gamers' needs. So manufacturers of mice, keyboards, headsets, um, graphics cards. And that was a very natural fit and an easy sell. And for them, basically, it was just getting their brand name out there in front of their target audience. Um, especially over the last couple of years, eSports has gotten so much bigger. Its reach, um, its footprint. The fact that we are here today, um, that there's so many different other industries moving into that space. Um, a few years ago, I would not have imagined a group like UTA to be involved in that space. But I think that just speaks to the reach that eSports now has. And it's created a whole new dynamic when it comes to brands. There usually isn't a week or two when there isn't a major brand um, that I'm talking to on the phone who's trying to figure out how to this is to Mike's point, authentically move into that space because primarily 
you are talking to an audience that's used to consuming your content on essentially an interactive platform, if you think of Twitch, if you think of Facebook. So the risks of misstepping are a lot bigger compared to linear TV. Um, if you put an ad out there that maybe isn't quite on message, it's not quite as terrible as if you do that in a medium where players can respond very quickly. And they're not shy about making their feelings felt and heard on that platform. So it's, it's a space that continues to evolve at a very rapid pace. I think there's sort of iteration. It's great to see professional groups take the lead and really try those conversations. And we've seen some great results out there. Yeah, and, you know, they touched on the authenticity and, you know, the digital content. You know, for me on the team side, it's a little different. So I'm reaching out. These days, I have three gaming houses that are over nine bedrooms. So I'm trying to can I furnish these houses with having to spend money? I might need a new mic. So my strategy is a little different. I'm trying to reach out to non-endemic companies that have no idea what even esports is and try to intro them and just introduce them to what this industry is. Not necessarily close the deal, but educate them because at the end of the day, we need to educate these partners that include our industry and provide them this guidance um, to to be successful, and I'll give a, a quick example. Recently, Caesars um, Palace actually just partnered with H1Z1 Pro League, and it didn't do well. So Caesars is now out of esports. Like they might do it again, but they had a very bad experience. I think we have to provide partners that have never been involved in our industry with a great experience and educate them on esports because a lot of these partners that are coming in have never been involved in this and really are scared. I've talked to multiple companies that I've worked with, one like Bedgear this year that we're all scared to do this, but I was able to save those deals because I was working with the Mavericks and I had arena assets and I was able to save deals through those things, but ultimately these brands are still scared to jump into our industry. So I think from a non-endemic side, you know, besides the content and providing digital and being authentic, you need to find the ideal goals with these companies. What are their goals and figure out how can we add them with esports? Because a bed company doesn't have esports goals. But in reality, most esports companies have housing that need beds and they're spending a lot of money on but bank companies don't even know this. I think Purple is the only one that stepped in our industry this far. And it's surprising. And Purple hasn't even done a huge job yet. So it's interesting to me how I don't think partners have done a bigger job on uh, introducing themselves to non-endemic companies. Um, and that's something I do a lot these days is, you know, even if it goes nowhere, you know, I still meet with them and educate them and let them understand where we're going in this industry for the next, you know, years to come when they're ready to come in. So building on, on what you guys have just described, which is really interesting, Mike, what you were talking about around data-driven insights and, and essentially farming business intelligence, right, that you can apply back and optimize and learn. Uh, are, there, are there other ways uh, that you guys would, would describe how you would define a successful brand integration or a campaign? Um, ultimately, there's different lenses on that, but um, I think if there's KPIs or if there's anything particular that would define success, um, what would some of those success metrics look like at a broad level? I mean, a lot of the stuff that I've done recently, I mean, in the past was, you know, there's different metrics that we look at to see what is successful and what is not. You know, for certain companies, the sales goals, like we're, how many people use our code, you know, when we promote it throughout the year, that's, that's a sales-driven goal. You know, then there's a the content goal, like did we deliver on the content, was it interactive and was actually creative where it made an impact, right? For example, I think everyone here um, saw the Ninja commercial with Samsung. Raise your hand if you saw the Ninja commercial with Samsung. You know, that was that was intense. That was that was a turning point for our industry. That was that was creative. That's a successful partnership. When you're able to create a one minute video that makes a lasting impact for our future. So I think, you know, it's, it's about the impact it provides, and it's also, it, it really depends if it's a sales-minded or impactful, you know, minded goal. So I think there's different ways. So from the publisher perspective, there's probably two different areas that we would like to hit, at least one of them, ideally both. The first one is very straightforward. It's the, the number on the check that the brand is going to, the sponsor is going to, to write to us, which helps offset some of the costs that the publisher has in setting up the entire eSports program. Um, eSports has gotten fairly expensive, the quality of production these days. Um, it, it takes a lot of people to, to make these things happen. 
So anything we can do to offset some of the costs is always very welcome. But the other part that's really important to us on the publisher side is finding publishers that can help us grow our footprint in that space in a way that makes sense for the product. Um, to give you one example, um, Arena of Valor, which is one of our biggest games, um, it's a mobile game. So not surprisingly, one of the sponsors or brands that we have as a partner is AT&T as a mobile carrier. So there is an obvious synergy between the two. And one of the things we're currently discussing is as a value add to players, whitelisting traffic that is generated from playing the game. So if, if you're a teenager who's on a limited traffic plan with their phone, suddenly there is an actual value proposition to having AT&T as your carrier because now your traffic doesn't count against whatever limit you have. Uh, beyond that, there are things like looking at being in their um, AT&T app. So there's other ways for us to put the game in front of you. So that just makes them as a partner a lot more attractive to us as a publisher. Uh, as we continue to work with brands, um, and we're still, you know, I'd say in the first or second generation, really just esports marketing and brands really, a few brands really just start just understanding the space. Uh, for us, trying to find that large brand like a Samsung or, you know, something in the PepsiCo umbrella where we can actually start investing in brand with studies and brand awareness studies. And I think, you know, scale and impressions, I think we all know that esports can drive scale, um, probably why we're in this room today, but it's really, how can we, you know, find that brand that will do a Nielsen brand study or a Nielsen brand awareness study? Uh, but since we haven't been able to find that brand, what we've been really measuring our success is really is just client retention. Like what are the, are you seeing brands come back year over year? Because if they're coming back year over year, you know that they're, they're tracking an ROI on their end, right? And so for us, is, you know, we've seen Geico come back year over year. We've seen HTC come back year over year, right? And so, um, you know, Mountain View is probably in its third year, but it's really just integrating into esports, and they're coming back again next year. So, for us, that really true measure of success is our brands coming back, our brands investing more dollars into those things. Well said. So, we're here at HeadFest, and, and part of the theme of this is the exploration of, of Eastern and Western markets. And you know, all of us work for global companies. We have global purviews. The, the regionalization, the nationalization, and the globalization, when you think a little bit about um, how these different communities develop over time, um, trend development, uh, human behavior patterns, uh, the amount of time that people spend playing games is probably the one thing that connects all of this to each other. Uh, it doesn't matter where you live, everybody plays all the time if you want to be the top of something. Uh, so, are there any sort of key differences or trends that you guys see, or, or I'd like to open this, this topic up less of a question and more of, uh, do you have any insights around uh, how the, the Eastern markets or the Western markets are, are trading information from each other? Uh, are there key learnings that are best practices perhaps in China um, that are being utilized here in, in the States? Uh, or, anywhere in between, uh, talk a little bit about your lens and your perspective uh, on the East and the West, and maybe some of those differences in what you see as sort of some, some trend crossover. I actually uh, had this conversation at lunch with uh, one of the Overwatch casters, and I actually was kind of picking his brain on that. And one of the things, main point actually, it's actually pertaining to the exact topic, but brands. He says Ch Korean and Chinese brands are fully invested into esports, which has torpedoed that industry, you know, times 10 to where we are today here in the US. And I think that's very important to understand was here in esports right now, it's kind of like you said, like, is this right going to come back next year? Like, do we know? We don't know. But these companies, SK, you know, Samsung, you know, all these companies out in those, you know, regions are making these long term commitments. Those long term commitments are driving the industry. Had, uh, forward in many and in a very fast way, and you could tell the difference of where esports is in Korea to where it is today in the U.S. And you you would think it's a whole different world. You know, they have you know paparazzi following them on commercials on TV. They have groupies. They have you know fandom. It's, it's just literally they can't even walk outside without people knowing who they are. And I think that's interesting to see how more advanced they are in that culture. And I'm not so familiar with it, so I'm not going to talk too much on it. I just thought it was interesting to get that outlook and understand that the brands are pushing the industry forward at a very exponential rate. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in 
the conversation that we have, especially with brands, you know, here in the States, we're competing against the NBA, we're competing against the NFL, and we're competing against generations following very fervent, you know, passion about traditional sports. And I feel like in Asia, they have less of that barrier just because esports has been around longer. I mean, OGN has been around, I believe, like almost 20 years now in Korea. Um, so the hurdle that we have to face and the re-education process that we have to face is a little bit more tough. And what's battling against us is the digital transparency in China, right? Can we trust those numbers? Can you, you know, in China there are numbers that you can buy and boost. So just being able to understand the market and understand that the, the digital stats um, is kind of a barrier um, because you see one article, one CMO sees that article, you don't trust anything in that, you know, in that world when it comes to digital. Um, but the, where we have seen traction and where we do see the difference between East and West is the consumption of the content and where we consume the content. And so when we talk to brands about how do we infiltrate into China or Korea or Shanghai or Taiwan, it's, it's understanding that the viewing experience is much different in Asia versus here. Um, here we have larger basements, living rooms, connected TVs, and we consume a lot of that content at home. Um, in China, you know, that content is consumed and can be consumed at internet cafes, uh, movie theaters, um, KTVs, et cetera, or karaoke bars, et cetera. So where and how and who they're consuming the content with is different. So it's tapping into those cultural differences and putting brands in front of them where they are and, and being able to translate you know, where you can see that needle move and where you can kind of create that same brand experience uh, that you can in the U.S. How do you do that on site, or how do you do that at a, you know, a karaoke bar or a movie theater like this in China? So I would say that Asia probably is several years ahead of um, the West when it comes to gaming culture and specifically esports. I remember being out in Korea probably ten years ago and being at big esports events that would fill stadiums, but. Prior to the actual matches happening, you would have um, K-pop bands come on stage, that the top bands in the country, and perform. And it really created that more social phenomenon that we're only now starting to see, um, partially thanks to some of the latest games like Fortnite, where really gaming is becoming more of a cultural force, and you see mainstream media starting to cover it a lot more than they used to. It used to be somewhat exotic in the past, where somebody would do a specific article like, hey, there's this huge event happening somewhere, have you heard about esports, right? Now it's to be gaming is becoming a culturally accepted thing. Um, in my previous role at Wyatt, I worked on the collegiate space, and part of my job was talking to the big conferences. So I onboarded um, one of the most esteemed conferences, the Big Ten, to run video games for all of their member schools. Um, so we're seeing a lot of momentum starting to build in the West, and I feel like the last two years have really moved us along a long way. But areas where I still feel Asia is ahead of the West tremendously is specifically mobile. If you look at mobile gaming, um, on eSports, uh, mobile has become the number one eSports platform for people to play on in, in most Asian countries. Um, it, it surpassed traditional sports. So in the West, we're only starting to see that. And I think to some degree, we're still struggling with perception a little bit, where most people here uh, have grown up playing on PC or console or both. And to some degree, that is still the gold standard when it comes to competitive. And in fairness, up until recently, phones weren't strong enough from a, a hardware perspective to really offer that same core experience that you would expect for that um, eSports audience to embrace. But we're starting to see that change, and we have the first titles now, and we're starting to see that catch on. So I'm, I'm really, really curious what the future is going to hold them. Yeah, we actually uh, went to the Arena Valor Global Championships at the Chinese Theater a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, and it was just interesting to see that, you know, when we went there, they were like, hey, we have I think it was like 11 million, like 10 million concurrent viewers that are watching this mobile eSports. We're like, where are the views coming from? What platform are you guys on? And they were actually being consumed straight from the actual app itself. So they weren't being driven to YouTube, Facebook, or even you know Twitch. They were all watching it from the app. And it was like a million people in Vietnam, like 20, you know, 10, 5 million in China. So the, the consumption of, of how people are consuming that content is just vastly different from region to region. And sometimes we forget that just living here in the States that there are other avenues that the publishers can take other avenues to have their consumers consume this content. Is that the kind of similar to what you did a few weeks ago as well, your Summoner's War event, where 
in the middle of the water and you know a game I never heard of so many people just showed up and the stream was over 40,000 viewers I mean it was kind of insane to see how big a mobile game that was at a very low level the impact it had on its audience so something similar that you brought up too wasn't even in eSport right uh, so I, I think uh, I think as we as we delve deeper into this, and those are all really good insights. Do you guys have any examples, tangible examples of of your favorite uh, brand campaign or brand integration, either within your own experience? You know, feel free to talk a little bit about uh, perhaps your favorite case study that you've worked on, or something that's inspired you at an industry level. I mean, there's a lot of different things I could answer that, but I'll, I'll kind of keep it at a, at a low level. I think for me, um, I think a lot of things inspire me. For example, that Samsung Ninja commercial back at that, that was very inspiring to see. TSM did a documentary um, a couple years ago, and it was kind of like a hard knocks where they show the inside life of everything, not just the good, but the bad, the real bad. Um, they left the cursing in there, they left everything in there. And I think that's what esports is missing. I think. Everyone understands that the interactive content and all that, but I also think we haven't really dived into the really showing the realities of the business and everything behind it, you know, and I think that's what the fans want to see these days. I mean, everyone could go and, you know, show these guys training in the house or play and create a hype video, but I think, you know, we really have to dive deeper, not just on the player side, but the business side. People want to see our lives and how we do things and how we operate, how can they do it? You know, that's why people come here and watch us talk. So, um, you know, I just think, you know, I think, Content from uh, from that shows that is split is very important right now because a few years from now when we're even bigger, we're not going to be able to do those things as we are now. And I think this is the time when it's going to help our industry grow. So I just think stuff like TSM has done in the past and really showed the inside life of really what it is to be an esports you know gamer as well as a professional running a business is very important. So those that's some of my favorites. So Tencent Publishing the West is still fairly young, and we don't really have the deep portfolio of super successful campaigns we have run yet. So at this point, I would like to give credit to one of our competitors out there. Um, I feel what Blizzard has done on the Overwatch League, working with Toyota, um, is, is really, really amazing. Uh, if you have a minute, um, not now, but after this panel, um, look on YouTube, um, look at the Toyota commercials they have done, it's, it's really compelling content that speaks so well to that audience. There's Reddit threads on it. Um, that focus group, that audience, really loves that kind of, of content that's been created. Well, it's a commercial. It gives it something fun for people to engage with, and it's proven super, super successful and powerful for them. I think um, in eSports especially, uh, it's hard to find brands that really understand um, and I think it's really hard to find agencies that understand these sports. So really, I feel like the last five years kind of been blind leading the blind a little bit. And uh, you know, when we talk to brands and when we consult with brands, it's also understanding that esports shouldn't be a scary thing. Esports is just another sport, and you can draw so many parallels to the way the content, what type of content is being delivered, what type of content is missing, the passion, the merchandising. Um, there are so many parallels when it comes to traditional sport. The only difference is that they're consuming the content much differently, right? There is no Twitch, there's no live streaming, there's no streamers. You can't watch Kobe Bryant do retired basketball practices, right? And so for us, it's it's helping them understand that, you know, just like the Toyota example, it's it's cars and coffee, but with the Toyota car, with the esports pro player, you know, it's not rocket science, and it's just retaking what's successful in traditional media and and just putting an esports into it, right? So there is no sports center of esports right now. So we help create the show Beyond the Rift, which is the number one talk show for League of Legends, right? And so you know we saw that there were actually no no team uh, no streaming houses that weren't associated to a team. So what we did is we put together five of the top streamers and put them in house in Beverly Hills. We call it offline TV. And so a lot of these things that are um, just a lot of these brands that see esports and think it's completely different. Um, I had a meeting with the CMO of a major auto company. And uh, they told us like, hey, uh, we, we should get into Fortnite. And I was like, hey, why should you guys get into Fortnite? It's all in the news, my son's playing it, how old's your son, he's 15. Um, who's your demographic for your car? And they basically said, hey, we actually left to 25 to 54. So Fortnite's probably not the best brand for you to be in, but it's the biggest e-sport out there right now. 
And so we asked the CMO, what do you guys do in traditional sports? We flunk for golf. Why do you flunk for golf? Because we love to see the car on the pitch, and when someone hits a hole in one, we want to create that experience. And want, we want to have that NASCAR Pepsi experience where someone's so excited to win our car. Um, and so we said, like, well, if that's your demo, and that's what you guys are going for, why don't we approach actually CSGO, right? It's the longest running eSport. We have the oldest demo in there, and they match the 25 to you know, 34 demo, and, we can, and they've actually put cars on stage before. And you can actually, and so let's do something where if someone gets a 4K kill or if someone does an ace, they can win a car. And so drawing the parallels of traditional sports, but not just throwing out their traditional sports marketing playbook just because they put an E in front of it, right? And so it's being able to kind of slow the brand down, let them take a step back and look at the entire industry as a whole and see where the parallels are with the current marketing efforts and just don't create a completely separate um, it's still a marketing campaign just for these sports. And you mentioned CSO, actually, it's an interesting you know, game to talk about because automotive has actually been big, big in CSO. If you look at ESL, um, ESL partnered with Mercedes Benz, and honestly, the partnership isn't, isn't really anything big. They didn't really strategize, but the CMO came out and said this publicly. He said, The reason we partnered with ESL is not because um, we knew what esports was, all we knew is we needed to get in. And I think that's important too, is because you know, they didn't have a strategy. And if you look at it, all they did is throw a logo on there, and that was kind of it, you know? And, but there were, but he understood the bigger picture of where we're going with this industry, just like everyone else. You know, like, the reason Tencent, you know, dive into esports, the reason UTA dive into esports, we understand the long-term longevity of where this industry could really go. And I think, you know, there's companies that do see that, and it's harder. And then you look at Audi, who sponsored Astralis, and, you know, they gave them cars, they paid, you know, high monetary deal. And it was a very successful campaign because it was very in, in, impacted of our industry because it was the first car deal that was ever done. I think that, you know, just to point those two examples, all those great examples, both in Europe, right? And so that is true. That, for us, is the hardest, where in Europe and Asia, they really understand the space. Um, but here, we, we, if they could put their dollars into NFL or even Major League Soccer or even NHL, you know, they have, you know, you know that NHL is working with uh, Nielsen and they're doing, you know, verification. They're showing, you know, back into the CPM and showing media value based off impressions put on TV, impressions put on social media. And so, you know, we really have to, the leagues ourselves, OWL, LCS, um, you know, even you know, Clash Royale, they have to evolve to the point where they're able to kind of do that ad verification and show that media value. Um, so, you know. When you're a CMO, you know, there's so many more options and so many different places to put your dollars when it comes to the United States. So, you know, that's always a constant uphill battle for us. I've signed teams in Europe and South America because it was safer than it was to do in the U.S., so I agree. So, eSports is a hot topic right now, and something that just made me smile as Roger was talking about it is, um, executives and, and big companies understanding that, oh, you saw there's something happening, it's talking to a really interesting audience, but then not really understanding how to properly address that audience or what to do with them. And it reminded me of, I mentioned the Big Ten Conference earlier, right? Like flying out of Chicago to the Big Ten Conference headquarters and sitting in front of, I don't know, a dozen of their commissioners who were all, all old white guys. Um, Probably the last time they played the game was in the 80s, that was Pac-Man, right? So trying to explain to them what is happening on their campuses and what 20-year-olds are playing, or even below that in high school, teenagers are playing, what that behavior looks like. Um, to some degree, there is a generational barrier between, between that. Um, some of the established, old-fashioned brands still not trying to grasp exactly what is happening there. Um, so. I think there's value in, in having agencies or having partners out there who can maybe help navigate that space a little bit. But ultimately, it really comes down to understanding, as a company, what your goals are and, and who your audience is and what you're trying to accomplish. Right. So in that regard, it is, it is very similar to traditional marketing. I love that. That was a good, uh, good, good conversation between everybody. Now, as we we've got about 15 minutes left. And as, a, as an extension of the conversation and the topic that we were just discussing, do you guys have any advice you know, for any, any brand or, or company that's looking to create a partnership? Maybe they don't know anything about this world. If you could give somebody page one out of the playbook 
or, or maybe the first chapter, you know, what, what would you tell somebody that says, you know, hey, Roger, Ramon, Mike, what do I do? Where do I start? How do I begin? You know, and that kind of touches on, you know, first being good at what we do is figuring out, you know, it's not about us, right? We got to figure out what the client needs, what are their goals, what are the company goals aligned. You know, so for me, it's more of, you know, figuring out what that is. And once we figure that out, you know, it's educating them because I'm assuming we're talking about a non-endemic who has no idea about what esports is. So, you know, it's just educating them on this market and what where it's going, but also painting the picture of a more long term. I think, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of deals where it's one year deal, six months deal, and it's like, you know, that's not that's not what these, you know, ultimately what these companies really want. You know, if you can't figure out a long term play to really show these people where it's going long term, you know, the short term goal, like if you're saying they pay me X amount of dollars for six months, you know, and you do the social media piece and that, that's not really, you know, engaging anymore or throwing a pack out there or something, right? You know, that's not really what brands need anymore. You have to create content that's interactive, that's really engaging. And like throwing out random content throughout the year and being consistent isn't successful. You know, it's just creating an impact. So, you know, you really have to figure out how to create that impact with that brand. So I think it's really, you know, showing them and educating them one on the industry, but then showing them how you're going to impact their brand into this industry. You're really showing, you're not talking about it. And that's the hard part because it's hard to show it, but there is ways you could show and, and, and interact and introduce these companies being creative and not just doing what your company is doing. You just have to be different these days. And like, I, I'll, I'll give one example, HyperX. There is about 500 teams, players reaching HyperX right now to sign deals. They don't really want to talk to anybody. Most sports companies like Invita, they're getting hit up left and right. You know what I mean? These non endemics are the partnerships people need these days. So you have to think outside the box. It's no longer being normal. Um, when we talk to clients, I would say the first three things we tell them is first, go to an event. Uh, we were just at ESO one this past weekend. Um, we brought AT&T out there. We did an activation. Uh, we did a meet and greet with uh, a former pro player, nothing. And his me and greet line was over an hour long. And every single client that saw it was like, who is this kid? And they kind of walk up the butt, who is he? <laughs> Even after seeing him, right? And so you can't understand, you can never understand the passion that these kids have unless you see it in person. To see a kid run across the hallway to go get something signed by their favorite players. And these are kids from all walks of life. You know, they're you know, the cool kids wearing the Yeezys, they're the, you know, you have these you know, typical stereotype esports man, you have the girls, you have the guys, you have the parents, you have the young kids. So it, it's, you know, our first advice to any of our clients is come to an event with us. Second, um, start watching the content. Um, you know, I, my favorite clients are the ones that send me links the next day and I'm like, who is this kid? He's awesome. Or what is this kid doing on the IRL section? Or like, what is this thing that people are watching 2000? Having to explain ASMR to a client is probably one of the weirdest things to have to do. Um, and then, and then third is tell stories. You know, if you look at traditional sports, um, you know, we, you know, Roger referenced, you know, hard knocks, right? We evolved into 24 seven, um, when it comes to back, uh, uh, boxing, you know, we've seen, you know, so many great stories, you know, ultimate fighter from UFC and these, the, the success of it is telling these stories. And when we talk about what's going to make these sports larger and what's going to double it and keep the growth exponential is the fact that. These stories, people are going to start relating to the players. Right now, it's so unrelatable because you just see a kid in front of a TV screen, but you don't know his problems with his family. You don't know the struggles he took to get to the stage of, you know, um, onto the stage of LCS or OWL. So, you know, the MVP from OWL this year, you know, wasn't even a pro player. He never played a pro player, a pro game before he even started OWL3. But no one's telling that story. And so, you know, for brands, our advice is find the stories that will, you know, that you want to bring in and be a platform for those sorts of sports. So I'd like to um, second that sentiment of if you haven't already, go attend one of the major esports events. It's not to exaggerate, but maybe a transformative moment. If you've never experienced it before, it really is very powerful. Um, second to that, reach out and talk to, to, talk to publishers, talk to agencies, talk to the teams. Um, Probably no single group cares as much about their product, about their game, as the publishers, um, at least if the publisher and developer are in the same house. Um, there usually is a long-term vision in where they're 
trying to take that game, how they're trying to grow the entire esports ecosystem that, that ties into it. And uh, I know we're almost at the end of our panel, but one of the things we haven't really talked about is typically the focus of these conversations is on the tier one competition, right? That is what gets all the spotlight, all the attention. And it's true, that's where most of the viewership sits. But in terms of reach, of actual engagement of people participating, if you go down that ecosystem towards tier two, tier three, towards grassroots, I mean, if you think about the collegiate space, the high school space, there's so many incredible opportunities out there. There's a lot of new companies coming to the market that are all trying to make those uh, markets accessible. Uh, there's some really, really interesting developments there. So definitely reach out, talk to us. Um, I think people usually find an open door at most big publishers. And sometimes, you know, understanding what your product is and, and what you're trying to accomplish in that space can, can trigger some great ideas. Um, one example I can give is I was at a different panel and there were some people from Nike, the big sports brand in the audience. And after the panel, they came up to me and said, like, well, that sounded all good, but Nike is all about sports, about movement, about getting physically involved. We still don't know how that translates to somebody just, you know, pushing a button on, on a keyboard or something, right? So it's like, okay, if that's what you're looking after, maybe it's an outgoing level, look at the teams, look at the professional teams. All of them, or most of them, have fitness coaches, right? Like there is a fitness measurement there. Um, so maybe that's your angle, right? Like you focus on trying to tell that story. So let's think about your product, what you're trying to accomplish, and then see what the right angle is to kind of be unique in that space and be authentic to it. Yeah, kind of what you just said as well is not just, you know, the publishers. We're all open books. I think we're at a point in our industry where we want to educate as many people as we can to understand where this industry is going to go and where we are today. And I think all of us are willing to talk about what we're doing, what we've experienced in the past. And five years from now, it might not be like that. So I, I always suggest people talk to the pro players, talk to the influencers, talk to the publishers, talk to the teams, talk to the agents. You know, 99% of them are going to at least give you five minutes of their time. And I would utilize that. My first, three, my first year in this industry, that's what I did. I picked people's brain, I traveled, I paid my own way, and I networked and learned a lot. And in five years, you're not going to get that opportunity because we're going to be in a way bigger realm than where we are today. And five minutes is not going to be the time we have in, in that future. So, you know, take advantage of where we are today and utilize, you know, the resources you have, which is a lot. So, Ramon, you mentioned Nike, and, and we won't delve too far into that, but, but I invite, we have another panel at 4 p.m. today that's about the culture and the lifestyle of gaming, uh, and I would invite uh, one of my partner in my business, Nate, uh, who's going to run this other event, to share some thoughts about that piece of it, because I think, the, I think there's some interesting stuff to rip on there. In the remaining time we have, what I, I think would be the best way to, to sort of end cap all of this 2019 and beyond for each of you guys. You represent a very unique uh, vertical, even horizontal, depending on, on your broad focus, uh, particularly on the publishing side. But if, if you were working and had one big sort of send-off to say about what you're doing in 2019 and beyond at a team, publisher, and agency level, what does the future hold in each of those areas? Where are, you know, let's, let's, let's take another play out of your playbook again, but this time on the strategy side of it, you know, what, what does this look like for you next year? Where are your focuses? And we have five minutes. Roger, why don't you get started? Sure. I'll make it quick. Um, for Philadelphia Fusion and Fusion University, you know, in 2020, we are planning to be full-time in Philadelphia and no longer playing in Los Angeles, you know, out of the Blizzard Studios. And what that entails is building an arena. So we are building a, a very big esports arena in the sports complex of the Wells Fargo Arena, which we own as well, um, to be our official you know, arena for Blizzard Overwatch League games. And every team is doing that. We're not just the only one. And I think that's a big you know, push for our industry as well, um, as well as for Comcast, you know, Spectacor and what we're doing over there. We have a lot of things planned for esports. Um, besides Fusion, and just keep on the lookout for that. 
you know, we see a bright future with this industry and we're fully committed for for a very long time. So for us, definitely our big bet is that the future of esports and gaming is mobile. We just don't quite know how fast that's going to really become the dominant platform in the West, but we're seeing a lot of traction already, so it'll be interesting to see what 2019 brings. But maybe to touch on the, the previous conversation a little bit in terms of um, being able to, to talk to publishers and, and learning about things, I feel like this is a two-way conversation, and already over the last year I have learned so much about talking to all the different parts of the industry, and I feel for me that's part of esports growing up, right? It's, it's not it's not any longer that like self-contained echo chamber that it was for almost a decade of just publishers and maybe teams um, talking to each other. Now we have so many different groups. We have agencies actually moving into that space. Um, we have advertisement companies. We have so many different new marketing companies and startups trying to focus and pinpoint how they deliver content and how to do those things. So it's so exciting to see what's coming to the market. I'm just curious to learn more about what everybody else is trying to to take in terms of the unique approach to that space. Hey Mike, before you answer, mm -hmm. you had an interesting thing happen with your little company recently. This yes. year, recently. Yeah. Why don't you start from then? Tell everybody what happened because that greatly informs <laughs> probably where, where this is all going. Yeah, so uh, a couple of my uh, friends and business partners from about three and a half years ago, uh, we were kind of all in the digital marketing space, all had about 10 years in, in uh, the agency space. My partner was the head of talent at Maker Studio. My other partner was the West Coast Marketing Director at BMW. And we kind of saw the giant white space begin to Twitch. Um, as a media buyer, um, we knew the only way we can access Twitch influence at this time was by getting minimum spend on Twitch and not being able to actually know or not having that transparency to actually how much was account being paid. And it was kind of in parallel to how YouTube influencers or buying stars on Instagram kind of first started out before MCNs. So, you know, knowing that no MCNs had really cracked that Twitch bug um, and there was no monetary value for them, that's when we decided to create a, a Twitch and influencer management company. Um, and then after about a year and a half of that, we started an esports agency, um, we consulting and picking up pro players. Um, and uh, after about two years, we were acquired by UTA. Uh, uh, earlier this year. And, um, you know, for that, um, you know, we brought over a roster of about 130 Twitch streamers and esports pro players, mostly in League of Legends and Overwatch and Smash Brothers and Counter Strike and Hearthstone. Um, but, you know, when that acquisition happened, a lot of people thought that we were going to bring esports professionals and Twitch streamers to Hollywood. And, you know, it's actually been the quite opposite. We've been bringing Hollywood talent to esports. And so the great example of that is Marshall. Marshall is a UTA client, you know, E3 Epic Fortnite, you know, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't just a coincidence. Like that was done by design, that was something that we were talking to Epic with for a really long time. Marshall was practicing. Um, you know, we just saw this past week post one was in the trailer for Call of Duty. You know, that was a deal that we were negotiating and talking about for you know, months on end. And that was something that, you know, post Malone loved playing Call of Duty, loved playing PUBG, and so it was kind of that synergy. Um, and so being able to do you know, uh, what we've been able to do is actually bring esports brands into Hollywood and not so much esports personalities. So, you know, we've been selling packages of product placements within Mar Marshmallow's news videos. He's averaging 8 million views per video. Um, and, you know, we've been able to get esports brands, you know, inserted into his, you know, music videos. We've been able to sell sponsorships for Post Malone's Music Festival. Um, you know, we also represent, you know, Will Ferrell. And he has an esports movie coming out um, later or it's in development later this year. So we have product placement packages for that for our esports brands. So being able to bring those type of opportunities to these brands like the HyperXs, you know, or you know, some other ones that's you know, I have to mention, but you know, bringing in, being able to bring those brands to the space um, has been the biggest shift and something that we're going to see where all the dollars uh, come from in the next couple couple of months, I believe. Um, and then second, in terms of the agent and talent representation side, you know, we're still looking for that LeBron James of Twitch and esports. You know, it took the NBA or even the NFL, multiple generations of pro athletes for them to find that media trained, savvy, you know, good on the phone, uh, good on the you know, video, good on camera. And, uh, you know, we have, you know, some, some personalities that, you know, are better in, front of, better in front of camera than others, but we still haven't found that one pro player or one, that one Twitch streamer that is really super charismatic and really wants to go into, uh, go into professional or linear TV. 
So in conclusion, the esports ecosystem is vibrant and it's alive. Uh, there's commercial opportunities, there's money being made. Uh, I would say there's a common misconception that there is profits being made in certain cases, unless you name Ramon and you're instead of a uh, publisher side. Uh, there, there are lots of different topics to delve. Uh, we invite you guys to come talk to us, ask questions after the panel. Thank you all for your time today. Enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you.